We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Would you believe there are only 76 shopping days left until Christmas? Well, you shouldn't believe that because I totally made it up. And anyway, 76 days, that's heaps. So why would it even worry you? And what's shopping days? I mean, every day's a shopping day now. It's not the 80s. God. I wouldn't bring it up at all if not for the fact that we are planning our Christmas break Patreon episodes right now. So while all the other podcasts in the world take a break and the proper radio shows and TV shows, our patrons will still get a brand new episode of Australian True Crime every week over Christmas. So you still have 76 days to sign up. That's a joke. To patreon.com forward slash Aust True Crime Pod. Who knows? I mean, it depends on what day you listen to this, eh? Hey? stupid and don't forget if you can't afford gifts you can give people something like a service like help people who complain about this bit in reviews to learn how to fast forward okay thank you to these patrons michelle sullivan zoe whiting Maze hotchkiss cox i mean she's got kiss cox in her name why would you not celebrate that before you talk about crime like why can't we do both? Why would you complain, like write a review going, oh, it's inappropriate to be funny before a true crime podcast. Why can't you do both? Not at the same time. I'm not doing them at the same time. I can go kiss Cox now. Pause. Crime. That's not disrespectful. Kate Maktia, Annie McGarry, Bianca Bonovich, Banovich, beg your pardon. That's not disrespectful, that's a mistake. Crystal McGuigan, Katie Scanlon, Lucy, Jessamine Oakley, Hans Bohr, and then Yale Strauss, straight after, that's fun. Nicole Stranwick, John Payne, Ashley Fitzpatrick, Noni Hare, Lana Taig, Jude Humphrey, Fiona Plant, Cassandra Telford, Latina Poir. Why wouldn't you celebrate Poir? Tonya Whitwell, Tia, Jules, Sally Friedmanis. Good name, Friedmanis. Oi, what about Katie Seamark? She pledged $10. Either that was a mistake or she's done all right. Well done, Katie. Maureen Hose, Alex Cooney, Dane Bilkin and Bronnie. Thank you. Okay, on with the show. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. It was a marriage made in hell, really. I mean, any, anybody that got too close to dust end up getting burned. He was very clever in his own right, a great lateral thinker. Nothing ever phased us. He was always a, had found a way out of most situations. He was gregarious. He was funny. He was cruel. He was almost... At times illiterate, he was generous, loving. If you talk to anybody, they will say, I hated him, I loved him. He was in total control. When suburban bank manager Bob Perry took a phone call from his sister back on the farm in 1992, he was strangely unsurprised to hear something terrible had happened at his old friend Darcy's farm down the road. By the time he arrived, word around town was there'd been a shooting. And so unpredictable had his friend's recent behaviour been that Bob initially thought he was the culprit. It soon became apparent, though, that Darcy was the victim And over the following days and weeks, the secret life of this pillar of the community and champion sheep breeder was laid bare before the conservative country community. Perhaps the biggest shock awaited Bob, who thought he'd known it all. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Sometimes our use of the term how people become victims is misunderstood as victim blaming. Of course it's not meant that way. It's meant in terms of considering how people cross paths with each other. 
What circumstances bring certain people together in certain incendiary or triggering situations that lead to one of them being harmed? And this case really is a good example of that if we look at it purely forensically. Darcy Wetnell, who's just one of the victims, lived in a time and place that limited his basic freedoms. And he was dealing with some childhood trauma. And the ways in which he learned to cope with that led to some pretty risky behaviour. Because of that behaviour, he crossed paths with another man who was no doubt coping in his own ways with some very significant childhood trauma of his own. The shock waves of disaster emanating from these two damaged children are immense. There are just so many ways in which Darcy became a victim and in turn victimised others. But we bring you the story from a subtle and fascinating perspective, that of Darcy's lifelong friend Bob Perry and his friend, author and Colac bookshop owner Neil Drinnen. Together they've written about it and about so much more in their newly released book, Devil's Grip. A lot of stuff happens in the bookshop. Like, not that much happens in Colac, but a lot of things happen in the bookshop. And, and, and when I opened the bookshop in about 2012, word got out that there was some gay bloke opening a bookshop <laughs> well, in Colac. What made you open a bookshop at all? I mean, I love that you did. When you write books, you get to go around and visit bookshops. And at, every time I do, I find myself thinking, oh, that's it, I'm opening a bookshop. Yeah. This is, seems like the most wonderful world and everyone says, no, no one buys books anymore and certainly no one buys them from shops. So what? tell us about opening a bookshop in Colac. Well, I moved down, I'm, I left Sydney and moved down to the country to have the tree change, yeah. to get away from all the stress and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And buying a bookshop does not get you away from all the stress. Oh, but um, but it takes a while to work that out. I thought, well, I would still need a day job and I'd worked in books and publishing all my life. And, and having a bookshop is actually a really nice position to have in a town in terms of meeting people, in terms of connecting with, you know, the arts and that part of the town. Uh, in that sense, it's been a, a great joy to me in lots of ways. And it was through that that um, Bob pretty quickly uh, – you know, I was almost like the only gay in the village sort of sort of scenario. And, and Bob Bob came in one day and we started talking and sort of, you know, gave each other that nod that, you know, that, that lets the other fellow know that you might be one of those, as we call it in the book. <laughs> and Bob reads so many books and he started reading books. He started reading my books, all my novels, and we became good friends. And then it gradually emerged that he had this connection to this case, which was this triple murder case, which I knew the story of. I, I, I remember it when I was a journalist for the gay press back in the 90s. Um, I didn't do a story on it then, but I remembered it. And it was then we started looking together, sort of me saying, I think there's a story in this, and Bob thinking, I want to write this story. And maybe a year or two of us sort of courting each other over it. What, what do you think, Bob? Oh, well, yeah, I was sort of in isolation at that stage. I'd sort of gone down to the bush and I was, I'd been there nearly 10 years mm. down in the bush quite happily. And then, I don't know, we just sort of talked. Neil has a lot of people come into his shop just to talk and he's a good listener. I'm interested in this, the nod that you were talking about before. You know, you were sort of joking, but sort of not. I grew up in the country and I distinctly remember asking my mum and having this conversation when I was a kid, how do gay people know each other are gay? I was wondering, how do they find each other? Gay people weren't visible. I didn't feel like there was a gay place to go and hang out. Or It's interesting that there was, there's a theory that some people run that, Gay people would be a lot better off if they were born green. Yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it, it's such an interesting concept yeah. if you really think about it. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't be hidden. You wouldn't have to hide. Mm -hmm. Your parents would know straight away so they wouldn't have this great trauma at, at the moment. 21, yes. Yeah. And, and you'd know straight mm. away. Yeah. But when you were a younger man, Bob, how did <laughs> men in the country let each other know, how did you meet other gay men? Well, we met at the Beats, of course. Oh, of yeah, course. Of beats in the book. Where else are we going to meet? Things have changed now with all the different apps and things that are on your phone. Mm -hmm. But I think Hopefully. it's an important point to make and I suppose for me personally it's an important point that I'd like to make because I have a family member who ended up HIV positive. Mm. 
I would say because of that system, because he was very closeted, married, had children and felt like he could never come out to his family and, and he, was having secret sex. And, and he brought that home. This is his family was, was not infected. I don't know how. Oh, look, I don't know the luckily. ins and outs of his relationships, but I yeah. felt later like if he had felt like he could be himself, maybe that yeah. wouldn't have happened. Why, why did he marry? Mm. That's a standard question that runs around the gay community and it's happening all the time as we sit here. So does it still happen? Yes, all the time. Yes. You'll still find online and on Grindr and Scruff and, and some of the apps that, you know, there's a lot of people who don't show their faces and who are living double lives. I mean, that's, that's still true. But very much my parents' generation, they were very much, there wasn't really a gay identity that you could, uh, have there wasn't a community as well, such, no and there's certain... as gay. Well, so we never knew each other as gay when we were no. young. I think that's what I picked up a lot. It was about it's all that repressed desire, mm. and then when obviously Darcy's a big figure in the book, he's one of the well, the main one of the main characters, and he was murdered. His sort of secret desires, but also his overwhelming desire to have a son because of the farming dynasty. So I, I found it fascinating. You've got the rural Australia, you've got the maleness of that, and then you've got this repressed desire that it just felt like it was only ever going to end badly. Well, the fact that he, he pulled that off, I mean, is is kind of bizarre. In his, but his wife had a terrible time and, yeah. and, you know, he was not a man who should have married a woman and, um, you know, that's sort of all in the story as well. But there's there's also that whole other side to sexuality in a world where, where homosexuality was a mental illness and it was a criminal activity that, that desire and, and the sort of chemicals that are released through desire become linked to the forbiddenness. So the excitement and the illicitness and all of those sorts of things come together to, to create almost another sexuality uh, you know that's why the beats and the and the and the secret locations became became so powerful in you know driving and desire still, still is powerful yeah. and Darcy's childhood was specific but can we talk about your childhood bob i was probably probably at 6 Probably a little bit older. Um, knitting. I have seven sisters. So I'm the youngest. How was I not going to learn how to knit? It's very cool to know how to knit now. I wish I could do it. Well, but the older brothers didn't see it that way. Yeah, I bet. So bullied. No, not bully, just normal family stuff. Yeah. Teased, teased. more like it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, hanging yeah, shit yeah. on each other. Hanging just teased. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, tricky situation with with some of them. Mm. But. Yeah, yeah, I realised I was gay early on, Ben. We we had furtive looks that you weren't you knew you weren't supposed to do and just little things you you know, you buy your kids um you buy your, your my granddaughter buy a little dress, tutu dress, she loves a tutu dress. Mm -hmm. Um and the little blokey's tractors. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. We do it without thinking, so we put them in a we categorised them very early. Yes. And I knew I had a little Bambi. I loved that little Bambi. I can still see that little Bambi. That little Bambi just disappeared. Oh, They're someone gone. took it off you. I presume it was Dad who, either Dad or one of the older brothers got it and burnt it or something in effigy. Or, I don't know. Because in those days, may I ask how old you are? I'm 71. 71 now. Yeah. So in those days, people really thought they could change didn't we thought we were creating children didn't we uh, that's an interesting thought isn't it if, if people if you believe that it's genetic then this book has a lot of resonance because it hopefully will convince some people that it is genetic it's funny you say if you do because i just assume everyone i was just assume it is do some people not well i i think probably some people don't and i don't think knitting would have made you gay and similarly darcy's childhood darcy wetnell who's one of the victims that we'll speak about he was put into care as a young child and was sexually abused in care by guardians and by teenagers there. And so some people then will think, oh, well, that's what made him gay, won't they? Well, one of the things that I'm, I'm that fascinates me at the moment is how early abuse can have two effects. One can be to completely ruin a person and uh, disempower them entirely, and the other can be that that they become a complete narcissist and they completely, in a sense, become what Darcy 
it became. He was able to develop this character that was very single-minded. He was a survivor, but you can see as you read the book what the cost of that survival was. That's so interesting. Let's talk about that because just a few weeks ago, Andrew Rule in his podcast was talking about some of the most terrifying criminals in Australian recent history who went through the boys' home system and who were sexually abused in that system and how they seem to take on this attitude of, I will never be a victim again, I will be the strong man as a result of that victimisation that they suffered as children. So tell us about, could both of you please tell us about Darcy as an adult? Who did he grow grow up to be? Apart from the fact that he was one of the world's foremost experts on Corridale, is that how I say it? Corridale sheep. So who was this man, Darcy Whittenall? Ah, many people, many people. Uh, I mean, my family, we, I've talked to them about this. Of course, we all grew up with Darcy. He was part of the family, basically. And none of us know, they all know a different Darcy. Everybody in the district knows a different Darcy. Um, he was a very complex personality. How did you meet him? My dad had a dairy farm next to Stanbury, and eventually Stan, Mr Wetnall, Darcy's cousin, sort of, they bought Dad's farm when Dad retired with a heart attack and we moved to, moved to Geelong. But all my youth, Darcy lived next door. So he was quite often at our house because we were one, I was one of ten. They had, by that stage, there were sisters with husbands and kids. They were all married to cockies all around the farm. So you had a big, big family, lots of kids and, and all of that all close together where it seems like his family... Obviously, he was put into care young, then he was living with relatives. Well, he denied he had a family. He okay. denied he had brothers. He denied he, everything. I knew his mum. She'd rang once that I'd talked to. Um, but he denied many times that he had family. Mrs Wettenall told me he had brothers. <laughs> But he denied he had had any family at all. And that was there. The whole 10 years I was there, I never met any of them. I never saw any of them. Um, His nieces, and he had nieces and nephews, apparently, but I never saw them. They were never at the farm. So to all intents and purposes, Mrs Wett and Mr Wett and all died very when I was very young, so I didn't know him. So it was only Mrs Wett and Das that were there when I got there. She was the wife of his his second cousin. So Rupert Wettenhall, who 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 she'd started Stanbury with, was her husband, and and he died in 1962. So she actually wasn't a blood blood relative. She was quite a bit older. She was an elderly lady. Mm. Yeah, she was. She was. Um, she was 81 when she died, um, and she was probably 40 ish when she married. So he's quite self-made, right? He's had a rocky childhood, but he's gone on to become very well regarded. Very clever in his own right. A great lateral thinker, nothing ever phased us. He was always a, had found a way out of most situations. He was gregarious, he was funny, he was cruel, he was almost at times illiterate, he was generous, loving, all those things. He was a very, very complex man. If you talk to anybody, they will say, I hated him, I loved him. And trying to write that character or trying to see what Bob's affection for him was or Bob's uh, sense of duty to Darcy was and, and my you know, your obligation to him and my kind of I struggle because he you know, it, in lots of ways he comes out as a, as a pretty appalling human being. Quite abusive in con- controlling I, I got like the way you were so selfless in you worked so hard didn't you with Darcy you know and you obviously had these deep affections for him but it was I don't know it's like you were in his thrall a bit yeah well when I when I finally decided that I couldn't go on with the business with you were talking about bringing something home to a married I was in that sort of situation I was I was I was married I had kids I had obligations I had all that sort of thing I was in the bank and I was Doing the beat. I mean, it was where was it going? It was a train? It was a train wreck? So I had to do something about it. I had to, and I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing, but I had to do it. And I was lucky. My former wife. I never, never talked to her about it until many years later. So she just accepted it as it was. And I was lucky. I got out of it. I had to get out of it. There was no alternative. And I did that and got away 
both you and Darcy kind of had... We had, were in the same boat. Yeah, you had a, on a, almost a pact because neither of you wanted your children to bear the shame of having, you know, poofs as dads, which was, was a, certainly Darcy could never have faced that, could he? You know, he no. everything about what he did with his son was to create a different experience for his son to what he had as a, as a young man, as a boy. We were in the same boat and I was... I was working as a driving cabs at night and I was working the bank during the day and then I couldn't sleep was, and I was living in a caravan and it was bloody horrible. Um, not eating because you never had time to eat. Yeah. Um, and the only person this, the only person that came anywhere near me was Darth and he turned up with a, a bag of groceries. I remember it and it was such a, a wonderful thing for me at that time and I think that's where the obligation started. I know now, probably as a bit of a sceptic, that Das did nothing without a reason, uh, but that didn't matter. That didn't matter. I really needed a hand at that stage and I wasn't going to ask for it. But what do you think the reason was, if, you, if you're going to be cynical about that moment? What, what? Oh, I think it was an attraction for us. He wanted me to moved to Stanbury. The, his MO was, he did that quite often. I didn't know anything about that, of course. And he had a house and they had a far, three farms all combined in one. And when they do this, there's always a house involved. And the house was sitting there doing nothing. So he said, well, come and, why don't you come and live in the house? I can bring my kids out there on the weekend. I liked that. That was that basically where wonderful. I came from. Yeah. And and for a board, I could, I could work for mm -hmm. board. And you were eight years younger and you were pretty hot and um, and you were perfect because you were such a kind of blokey bloke. So it that all sounds good to me, <laughs> if and I'm the, honest. And the family, he knew the family. Mm. So um, we all know, knew each other. He could move me in there without any question. Basically, I know what happened. And it worked for me. I've I'm, I'm, got to be honest, it was good for me too. I mean, um, were you attracted to him? I didn't know. I don't know. Probably the physical attraction was fine okay. and I was, I was in a spot where uh, I needed a hand, basically. And it's pretty hard to explain, but it worked out for both of us, yeah. And I, and I was so confused. I had a wife and kids and mortgages and it wasn't just, it, it, that's a bit, how can I put it? I loved the lifestyle. I, I was just basically a farmer that was working in the bank. I came off a dairy farm, you know, we were all farmers. And the lifestyle I knew, and I would have stayed there forever if, well, if Das had been able to be a little different. But. And you describe that as well in the book. You say that the farming lifestyle, it either people just love it or it breaks them and I find that fascinating as well. And that's what's great about this book. There are a number of things that are great about it that set it apart is that I learned a lot about sheep breeding, by the way, and I love that and about farming mm -hmm. and and I love that and I love it's evocative about mm -hmm. the the farm and I also love that it includes so much about your experience. Neil and about the generations of growing up gay in Australia. Well, that was one of the things that I kind of perhaps didn't see coming when we first embarked on on doing this book. But then I then it quickly became because the the AIDS is so relevant to how the story turns, mm -hmm. and so a lot of this was about looking at at you know really two generations of of gay men. Me as a journalist in the 80s during the, the AIDS crisis, um, watching what that was doing, these guys are in the country sort of away from it and probably not really knowing very much about it at all. You know, it was really a terrifying decade to be gay. That was a very, very kind of white knuckle decade. What, what happened between you and Darcy, Bob? He just decided it was over. Oh, really? That's it. Well, he never actually said that. He just uh, stopped the sex. We weren't having sex anymore. And I said, what's going on? Nothing. Didn't want sex anymore. I, now, the, uh, it all came out later on that he wasn't, um, he was going elsewhere. Um, he was heading to Melbourne, uh, blah, blah, blah. We, uh, uh, the HIV thing, I didn't know anything about until after the 
coroner's re report. When they did the coroner's report, we all found out that he was HIV. It was in the papers, blah, blah, blah. It was, was big news. About three weeks after the murders, we got the reports that he was HIV. So you wouldn't have had any idea before? You wouldn't have even thought that your health was jeopardised or anything, yeah. When did he stop coming to see you? When did he stop sleeping with you? Oh, probably 12 months before that. I mean, what do you think, Neil, do you think it's possible that he knew he was HIV positive and that was the reason why he stopped sleeping I, with Bob? I think, that, I think Bob and I both decided that. Bob, he came back from South America and Bob had a sort of sense that something had happened and, and of course, you said on lots of occasions he was having night sweats, he had, had rashes. Um, there are a whole lot of predetermining indicators there and, and one of the things that, we speculate about in the book is that perhaps part of why he stopped having sex with Bob was because he knew, uh, he knew what he had. And so he went elsewhere and sought the company of men who he deemed to have no real value. And that's where the, the tragedy kind of pollinated, I think. Yeah. yeah, sitting down all these years later and trying to work out what actually happened, that seems the most logical way. Uh, and it, it's sad in a way that he couldn't come to me and tell me these things um, and to think that he thought so little of me that I wouldn't, you know, stay with him, wouldn't back him up, wouldn't help him, you know. And that, that's sad. To me, that hurts that he he didn't value our friendship that much that he could talk to me in those sort of he, he was dying he was in that stage you've got to understand to get hiv to become hiv positive was that you were going to die usually within three years at the time that was about the the average um amount of time people were were living in the in the 80s so it was a pretty a pretty yeah, short no sentence for a young person particularly if he was symptomatic already right and not being well there really weren't any medication that were effective in the late 80s there were trial drugs and there was but he wasn't accessing any of that after the break Darcy Wetnell's lonely spiral continues Neil's bookshop in Colac is called Cowlick, by the way, so do be sure to drop in if you're in town. Coming up on Australian True Crime, Darcy meets his match in another damaged man. But first, his tragic obsession with having a son. Everybody that knows Darcy will say that he treated his workers badly, he treated Mrs Wet badly, he probably treated Guy badly. He treated Guy different to other jackaroos that was there. He certainly treated me differently to any of them. One of the stock agents down there only said to me the other day that he said to me that why doesn't Darcy hit me? Uh, Darcy never hit me. Darcy never yelled at me. Um, he didn't need to. He was the boss. I didn't mind that. That was fine with me. So he was violent with some of his workers? He was, yep. I've seen it. He was almost out of control sometimes with them. His prestige seemed to allow him to to be like a celebrity chef or something, and just really, yeah. <laughs> really mistreat his staff. Which I uh, that was something I had to kind of how, how did he get away with this when I was writing it? Guy Whitnell was his son. Who was Guy's mum? Jan McDonald is her name, and she was from another sheep breeding family in New South Wales, and she met him when she was about 16, and he was in his early 20s. Yes, it was a marriage that was pretty disastrous for her. His obsession to have a son is pretty much what dictated all the terms of that marriage, and once they had a son... Darcy never, never actually said that. Said what? That you got married just to have a son. A lot of the research that we did about Jan, she yeah. did she did a big uh, interview back back in the nineties for Women's Weekly, and she said that that was that was his obsession. Yeah, Jan, um, Jan said that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was um it was a marriage made in hell, really. I mean, any anybody that got too close to Das end up getting burned. He wasn't a he wasn't a he was in total control. His relationships with women were quite toxic from an early age and whether that's because he was rejected by his own mother or spent so much time in care or 
you know, had a fostering that was really toxic. It's hard to know. We don't really know. We we have to piece together some of those aspects of his early life. But we do know um, that whatever happened to him was essentially a rejection of his own family. And he was basically adopted by Janet Wettenhall and her husband. And um, he, he kind of became their son, really. And so did Jan stay on the farm? She was there when you were there? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh-huh. Jen was never there when I was there. Yeah, she was gone when I came. Yeah, she, my sisters know more about it. She used to turn up at their place quite ill um, and trying to deal with us and the baby and all the rest of it. No, she left. She didn't um, take Guy with her? She left? She took Guy with her, but Das got him back later through the courts. Pretty amazing at the time. It, uh, that is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. But he had everything to offer the child. He had a farm, he had support, he had money, he had prestige, he had everything. And Jan was trying to make a life for herself, nursing training and the rest of it. And she left Guy with her mum, apparently. I'm, this is secondhand stuff, but she was uh, with her mum and um, Das said she wasn't looking after the baby properly. So he went and they went and took him. And then they went to court and... He was, Das was awarded custody of him. And that was in large part because Janet Wettenhall, mm-hmm. senior, she was prepared to be the other guardian. And so it was a reasonably complex and dark moment, I think, in the in the family history that, that she lost custody and, and they, they gained custody. Yeah. She was just a young mum trying to get, get by and they just completely railroaded her. The theme of mothers and motherlessness really does run through because the man who murdered Darcy, he was really searching for his mother too. So let's talk about then Wayne Walton. How does Darcy come into contact with this young man, Wayne Walton? Wayne Walton, who was the murderer, he uh, met him at the Gill Homeless Shelter for Men, which was in North Melbourne, and it was a Salvation army run place which I think had sort of been there since the depression and may well have been a place that Darcy stayed himself when he was a teenager homeless and and working at the racetracks and and doing what he was doing before he found his way to Stanbury so he met a number of young men there or youngish men and Wayne Walton was there Wayne Walton had been in and out of jail for he was only twenty four, but he'd been in and out of jail and care so, since he so what's was Darcy doing about there? Is he just cruising fourteen there for, himself. So what's Darcy yeah. doing I mean, there? Is he just okay. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. and 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 this wasn't the first man he p- picked up there, and it wasn't the f- first man who he'd taken back to Stanbury and installed in the place as well. He'd had Bob there for a decade, so Bob had been a significant person. Uh, and and companion and family member really for a decade. But when Bob left, that's when he started looking further afield for for sexual partners, for people to help on the farm. So he'd just arrive back with a new guy and say, hey, everyone, this is Gary. He lives here now. He's a new guy who works here. And that's- this is it's interesting. We've talked about that, haven't we? How on earth he got away with this? Because this is a bro. He broke the golden rule: never bring them home. Never bring them home. Because he was trying to impress him with his money, his property, his prestige, his flash car, all these sort of things. But why bring? He knows their trouble. And he brings them home and introduces them to Mrs. Wett, who is a refined, lovely culture. Yeah, he's woman. he's bringing home rough trade. He's bringing home rough. That's the word for it. So he could control them. Absolutely, he doesn't. He doesn't pay them. He tells them he's yeah. putting their money into accounts for them, which he. He's yeah, playing with fire, isn't it? And it's and but at this stage he's also crook. Remember, he's also he's limited life at this stage. He doesn't know how long he's got. So he's, one of the one of the things also with. With HIV, and you know, we don't know. They might have diagnosed him as HIV positive after he was murdered, but they didn't do any blood work. We, you know, we that we don't know how sick he was, but there were a lot of kind of bloodborne viruses and stuff that made people pretty crazy yeah. with HIV. And the way his behaviour went in that last year of his life, and the sorts of risks he he took, were probably symptomatic of of some of those things. Yeah. Bob wasn't there. No one who was there is alive anymore, and so we really had to speculate about how much 
much things were slipping, yeah. uh, how much the, the relationships between all of them were starting to be strained and, and what was happening. It, it was always strained. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Yeah. So so. Between he and Guy and Mrs. Oh, no, Wet. Guy was fine. Preshy was, we used to call him, Darcy used to call him Preshy. Preshy? Precious. Precious. <laughs> Little boy. I know. It's terrible. Isn't it? It's gorgeous. It's That's not terrible. Called the, but uh, the relationship between Guy and Darcy, Darcy was hard on him in a lot of ways, but in other ways he indulged him a lot. So the relationship, uh, he was never physical with Guy. He dominated him, of course. But Guy turned the tables in that one, apparently. A guy always had the whip handle because he was the only son. He was it. So he always had the whip handle. He just realised it later on. Uh, but the relationship between Darcy and Mrs Wet was always nasty. Oh, always. on both sides? Or? Oh, no, Mrs Wet would not never be nasty. I never heard her swear. I never heard her say, well, she'd say, oh, Darcy, that would be it. Um, but she, I know she's a... She was a lady, Mrs. Wet. Anybody will tell you that. But Das treated her terribly. He was horrible to her. What must she have thought of these young blokes coming back? Could you imagine she it? She would have been shocked. But she, but then they'd always had workers there. Yeah. They'd always had jackaroos and jillaroos and workers. So she treated them just like she would one of the workers. Yeah. She didn't know what was going on. It's not as if he waltzed them in as his, yeah, his lover. you know, lover or anything. There was never anything. Das and I were never like that. We were never lovers, not to anybody else. And Mrs. Wet, well, I used to say to him, Mrs. Wet knows. <laughs> and he'd say, no, no, she doesn't know. And he was petrified that Mrs. Wet would know. Or my, my sister and her husband that lived just up the road that Das would drop in in the middle of the night because their light was always on, they'd be asleep in front of the television, but we'd go in and make a cup of coffee and go home again. The country. Um, she, she knew, but he was petrified that they would know anything, and it must be perfectly obvious. We don't know. How do we know? But I'm sure Janet Weddenhall did. She was a very astute woman, and she would have been playing her role through uh, through all of this, and prob probably been in a, a state of considerable despair when these the last two Waynes came to stay. So, what happened when the last Wayne came home? Well, that was where things got really, really complicated, and that's where. Bob and I maybe diverge in some 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 of our thoughts about what was happening, but in a way that last Wayne, whose own life experience was completely tragic. You know, he'd grown up with a father who had murdered when he was eleven years old. He watched his father stab his nine-year-old sister to death with 27 stab wounds to punish the mother for an affair he believed she was having with a, a guard in the prison he'd just come out of. So you get some idea of the sort of background to his life. None of this, of course, Darcy knew about, but he came into the house with a, a history of darkness far far greater than Darcy could ever, ever have known. And we believed that he could see how pathologically terrified Darcy was of his sexuality being revealed and started to play that, you know. There was talk of blackmail. There was he was borrowing Darcy's car, which, as Bob said, no one, no one, he wouldn't have let anyone drive his car. So there was a whole shift in the power dynamic and... <laughs> And stuff was stuff was going bad. He had money on him when he was caught. Yeah, then that two thousand dollars in cash, living in a caravan, unemployed. Where does he get two thousand? There, so Das was so in such a bind. You know, he was ill. He was uh, this young bloke had found out his secrets. He was wide open to blackmail. And he was so no, unpredictable, this Wayne. Well, my, you know, one of my theories is, and is that really it was almost like a um, aggravated suicide in a sense. Oh. Darcy was at a point now, whether this was conscious or subconscious, but he he'd always been a bully, and he's always chosen his targets. And and you know, if it's true that a bully is always looking for someone to stand up to him, finally he found it with Wayne Walton, and. You know, he was at a point in his life where he was really facing a horrible decline into a highly stigmatised fatal illness with AIDS, or he could have 
one almighty standoff, which ended in his murder. Well, he was also facing a situation where sort of at any moment he could have some kind of medical episode that could see him admitted to the local hospital and the yeah. whole thing blown sky yeah. high. Yeah. Like I've seen Darce with jackaroos and he had this this strange obsession. He had to break them down. If He, he sort of saw himself as someone who took these young people who had problems and he would make them whole. And he'd done it a lot of, with a lot of people. A lot of jackaroos went on to do good things. It sounds like you're talking about wild horses when you say that, breaking yeah. wild well, horses. He, he used the same principles that he broke horses to break people, yeah. break these. And he would keep at them and he was really good at it until they burst into tears. Once they burst into tears, and these are kids 22, 23, 24, he was fine. He, it, it, it he would turn into this benevolent, friendly, supportive individual. Amazing. And he must have seen, because this bloke and Guy would go shooting. They had Guy had all these guns. He, was, he had about four or five guns up in the gun shed. And, and so Wayne Walton, so Das must have seen how dangerous Wayne Walton was, how proficient he was with with weapons, um, and uh, because Walton and Guy had gone shooting him all over the place. Das must have realised how dangerous this bloke was, and he, and my the, my thought is that Das has pulled his act on this bloke, and instead of bursting into tears, this bloke has just gone up the shed and got the gun and come back and. Oh, oh so did. your theory is that Darcy underestimated this guy? Absolutely, he did. He met his match, and everybody will say it's about time Darcy went and all met his match. That's the general reaction that I get. What happened? What What do we know for sure? Well, I mean, the, the, what no one could have foreseen was that that he'd kill two other people as well. And I think that that's, that's the unanswerable thing. I mean, uh, I kind of perceive it as, uh, as and, and he was on a lot of alcohol and a lot of Serapax and he was pretty off his head. You know, something in me tells me that, that he just saw this whole establishment, all these double standards and lies and all of the, the bullshit of it as something that he just wanted to blow away. You know, he'd, he'd looked at it and whatever it was that Darcy was doing, it was just all rotten and he just, he ended it all. Um, you know, how intellectual he was in making that decision, who could say? So he shot all three of them. He shot Darcy, his son Guy and old Mrs Wetnell, who was at that stage 81 years old. And he went back and shot them more times, didn't he? He shot the, the men and he only shot her once and he just... I mean, he, he really didn't make any great attempt to escape. He, he ran off with his uh, with his caravan mate on a drinking binge in a stolen car and got apprehended down in Brighton less than 24 hours later. So there was no great kind of plan. It doesn't seem as though it was premeditated. Do you remember where you were when you got the news, Bob? Oh, yes, I was in Melbourne. I was I was um, in the bank in Melbourne then. I was a relieving manager in Melbourne. The last, my sister rang me, um, the one that Bass used to go into all the time, and she rang me and said, Bob, something's going on down at Stanbury. There's uh, helicopters and police cars and roaring down Devon Road, something's going on. Um, I said, oh, I don't know. I said, oh, come on. So I came home and I first thought, damn, Bass has killed Mrs Wet. That's what I thought, because their relationship was horrible sometimes. And when I got there, the police had cordoned off the front because the driver probably half a mile down to the house through the property, and the police had cordoned it all off. The neighbours were all at the front gate, and that's as far as I could get. And then they said there was three bodies, and I thought, oh, what the hell is going on? So we knew there had to be a third party or another party that done this. And, and you thought then that it was it was all of the family? Well, three had to be. Uh, we didn't know. No one was told. The police hadn't said anything. Uh, but the the lady who found them, Mrs Loffel, well, she, we'd heard who it was. Um, she says, Guy's face. Oh, anyway, um, it was. It must have been a horrible thing for her to find these bodies. Well, she found one and then just ran. After that, the biggest twist in the story really was that, that Bob was Guy's executor. 
And Bob... Um, Did you know that before he died? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. But I expect, I've been gone 12 months. Yeah. And, well, Darcy wasn't happy when I left because he won't put this proposal, oh, you can stay here, there's no reason to go. We're, uh, but, of course, I wasn't going to be caught in that one. Oh. But uh, I'd been left for 12 months, so I assumed that that had all been changed. But it hadn't. And when... When the, the murders had happened and and the farm was there, it needed to be run, Bob was the only person in the world really who knew what to do because everyone was dead. So I left the bank uh, and I and Bill and I ran the place. Well, Bill wasn't there. I was there most of the time and another, another young bloke was there. It was, I gladly did it because yeah. I loved the place. Yeah. Um, and we kept it going for 12 months until it could be sold as a going concern, and that was worth a lot of money to the estate, that it be sold as a going concern, which it was. Who inherited the estate, if I may ask a crass question, because if he said he had no family anywhere and then Guy died with him? It's complicated. The fact that each of their wills fed into each other basically meant that it was it was unclear and also was unclear who had died first and so much of the of the disbursements would be affected by the order of death and so they had to look at how it appeared to have happened and how else it might have happened and the the executors all had to agree on a, on one particular outcome and the financial disbursements that came out of that so it, it is a fascinating aspect to the story the way the way things went and revealing that hasn't impressed a, a few people <laughs> let's be honest but it, well, it was interesting if if guy had died first then Darcy's estate instead of passing to Guy, because he predeceased him, would go to his closest relatives, which would have been his mum. It, oh, yes, it, of course. It complicated, complicated the whole, the whole thing. thing. So apparently there is a precedent the solicitors got together uh, that... Oldest to youngest. Of, yeah, and cases are like that where there's any, it's simply oldest, oldest to youngest. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. So, so Mrs. Wet, Guy, Darcy. So, so Jan, Jan got it? No, 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 no. When Guy came to me to, to talk to me about, asked me to be his executor, he said to me, who do I leave it to? I said, well, you leave it to your father, of course. Oh. Um, and 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 then if he predeceased you or something, then you leave to whoever you like. Mm. I remember saying that. You just leave to whoever you like. That's up to you. So he left it to all his mates. <laughs> and, and that was it. After all this time to tell the story through your eyes, from your perspective, how does it feel? How does it feel to have somebody say, we've got to get this out there, man. We've got to tell your story. It's not actually telling the story. It's, a, it's the interaction between Neil and myself over the last two years, which has been the liberating thing for me. I'm a different person than what I was two years ago. Um, uh, uh, there are there were remnants two years ago of still hiding. I was a recluse basically, and I've come I've, I've come out again. Um, the first time was in the papers. This time it, I'm doing it deliberately, and I've already had people, my family. Well, it's cost us a bit, hasn't it, here and there? But the the passage has been what's important to us, to me at least, and think, it's fantastic. I think you know the the book is what it is. Um, because of the friendship that we've had and because of what, the way we've been able to go on this journey together. And I think some of the things that are icky to some people about the fact that we've dug up things from the past or whatever are kind of inevitable. You know, I think that, that both Bob and I realised that we've had to stick our necks out quite a bit with a, with well, a number of things in a regional part of Australia, you know, Victoria where we live. And I think it's all of that's going to be worthwhile. But you do have to have a bit of courage when you tackle some of these things because there are always going to be people who won't want to look at some of the issues. And you both talk about your HIV status, which is really, it's not a death sentence anymore, but it's very brave because it's something so personal and like health stuff is personal and you... Well, it's very brave or very foolish. We don't know yet. <laughs> Um, I think I think it's I think we both decided at one point that that we really had to include that because 
it's such a part of the plot, even though it's not the story. It's one of those things that um, has affected, well, I think Darcy, we might, I, you and me. I and think the, the main thing that I just want to get across is that, in um, my opinion, the whole all this happened because of all these secrets that Darcy and I kept, yeah. the beat, all this sort of stuff, this, this pathological desire we had to keep at all a secret. Yeah, but, yeah, but that, that wasn't your fault. fault. No, no, but, but, for but, doing uh, that. Now, but it's my fault now if I perpetuate that. And and um, Neil and I decided we would, when we were writing the book, the first thing we do, we'd tell it all. We were There weren't going to be any elephants in the room. All HIV, um, a lot of things we were going to talk about. And that has offended some people. Um, my older siblings, uh, you know, they... they they won't read the book. Some of them won't read the book um, because it's a bit tacky for them. And that's fair enough. I understand that. But that's the way it is. That's the life we lead. That's the life Darcy and I led. Um, and it's a story that's got to be told. Uh, and it's already resonated with some of the younger ones in my family. If the book does nothing else, that's it's a success to me. Devil's Grip by Neil Drinnan is available now. You can buy it in the bookshop on our website, australiantruecrimepodcast.com and everywhere else you buy your books. And don't forget to drop in on Neil next time you're in Colac at the Cowlick Bookshop. He's a very good listener, I'm told. Thank you for downloading this episode of Australian True Crime. We'll be back next week.